There it is. Sonic Adventure. One of the loudest things known to man. My ears might be bleeding, but if I hadn't heard it, my heart would be. This game is a little bit rough. People are always throwing around the, oh gosh, Sonic Adventure and Super Mario 64 aged like milk. But you gotta remember, this was a really long time ago, and for them to pull off something so spectacular on their first try like this? My gosh, like, it, it was a historical event, I wish I was alive at the time. Actually, sorry, I'm a little stupid, this came out in 1998, so I was alive, but I w was actually busy, probably. And the reason I bring up Mario 64 yet again is because in this sense, it's a very good comparison, because that is my favorite game of all time. This one is a very close second. But in both games, there are things that I just can't stand. But that doesn't mean that the whole game is like that. I think each game has more to offer than just the sum of the things people might not like. Sonic Adventure is all about this water man named Chaos, who bursts out of the Master Emerald like it's Knuckles' birthday or something. Of course, you won't know it's his birthday until you go play his story, since instead of the plot being told all at once, Sonic Team decided to make seven separate campaigns that each follow one of the playable characters so you can see what they're up to after you run into them during Sonic's story. After replaying the game again for this video, I've become a little bit mixed on this approach. On one hand, it's really neat to see how each character interprets the events of the story. The cutscenes often have different dialogue because it's how the character is seeing how things are playing out. But even with that, playing Sonic and Tails campaigns back to back feels like retreading old ground since they're together for almost the entire story. I think this story system can definitely work, and funny enough, I think they nailed it in Sonic 06, where you might have extra characters with you, so sometimes during your stages you end up switching to them. I think in the perfect world, if a character is with you, maybe you could just switch to them whenever you wanted, and, you know, the story would still be the same, because they're all together. That would also encourage replayability as well, which is never a downside. It's up to you, but I feel like maybe the best way to play this game is to not play the stories in order of unlock, because you might want to do, like, Sonic, then Knuckles, so you have some variety, then go back to Tails. That way, it's been a little bit, so you kind of remember what you did, but it's a distant memory. It feels nostalgic now. Anyway, we were talking about chaos. Uh, Sonic is the next woodland creature to meet the beast, and luckily, hedgehog quills are stronger than bullets. Or the police just weren't shooting the big floating brain part of chaos. You know, the only thing that resembles some kind of vital area. Oh no! Our weapons are useless! You know what? That would make a fun fishing minigame. I never understood why Chaos jumps onto the four flagpoles here, and then sometimes just jumps back down without doing anything. Like, is he just showing off? Regardless of his mad ups, though, we hit him three times, and he is soggy toast. The following day, Sonic is lounging by the pool at a resort he almost certainly has not paid to be in when Tails zooms by in a rapidly descending plane. Wow, is it Tuesday again already? Whatever happens though, I think it's for the best, because now we get to play one of the greatest opening levels in any game ever made. Take it away, June! I will never get tired of running down these beaches, even if it gets a ton of sand caught in homeboy's shoes. I don't really like the beach in real life, probably because I can't spin dash and get some mad jump height like Sonic can. Who, by the way, I feel like is at his very best in Sonic Adventure. First time's the charm, as sometimes people say, sometimes. He's fast, he's cool, he controls like a dream, which just so happens to be completely perfect for the console of origin. When I say I love this game, this is what I'm talking about. Sonic's campaign, blowing through this thing, using all the shortcuts and feeling the, the breeze of the wind in my virtual hair. I don't think any other game compares to how I feel when I play this game. There is an unreal sense of freedom in these levels, even though you have a clear goal to get to. The way you get to it could be different every single time you play. So in review, beach aesthetic, good. Set pieces, very good. I almost got killed by a whale. I will mention this in the Yelp review. It's just so wonderful how this stage encourages the learning of your abilities. You have the homing attack, which becomes Sonic's iconic move for almost all of his future 3D entries. You get the spammable spin dash that never feels bad to use. 
And of course, eventually we'll have the light speed dash, which is not very light or speedy when you first get it, but give it some time, we were all awkward in middle school. Once we reach the far side of the beach, Tails is just sitting around like a lazy oaf. Come on, buddy, chop chop. We're gonna be in some hot water if we don't find that chaos creature, and I'm not talking about the hotel's hot tub. They wouldn't let Sonic in the hot tub, because after a few minutes he starts smelling like wet dog. Wet hog, whatever. Turns out, Tails had one of the Chaos Emeralds, which he was using to pilot his new plane, when it caused it to malfunction. Have you ever heard of, uh, batteries, Tails? When the duo rolls up to Tails' workshop, our old friend Dr. Eggman arrives to cause trouble. Could have sworn he had a different name before, but, uh, who's counting? Angered that Sonic won't roll over and die, he brings in the big guns. This is the Egg Hornet, the most pathetic thing Eggman has ever brought to this world. Homie must have missed the memo that the homing attack just got invented. Right after this, Tails is out in the open with the Chaos Emerald going, It sure would be awful if someone stole this from me. Whoops. And now Chaos is f ripped. We might want to find the rest of those emeralds, like, ASAP, because every time he slurps up an emerald, he gets stronger, and we've seen what all seven emeralds can do to a hedgehog. This could get out of hand really fast. Sonic and Tails head to Windy Valley next, thanks to some conveniently gifted plot device from the heavens. I don't know if they're tracking the emeralds in some way, but every way they turn, they're basically tripping over another emerald, so that's convenient. Windy Valley's a little bit of a step down from Emerald Coast. It's a lot more restrictive, with like small pathways and a lot of automation where you're running, but you're kind of just seeing the spectacle, you're not really doing anything. The tornado section's really neat, though. I love the idea of Sonic moving so fast that he's able to climb up the floating debris and launch himself back out. Because, you know, if you're a regular person and you get caught in a tornado, there's no platforming obstacle course to get you out of it. You just go directly to Oz. Y'all ever fall for, like, a really stupid playground rumor? Because in this level, I was told by someone that if you landed on the eagle after coming out of the tornado, you would get a rainbow chow egg. You would have to carry it to the end of the level, and then you would have a rainbow chow. And to this day, I still try, because, like, maybe it's real and just nobody's seen it yet. Maybe I could be the one. If it came off like I don't like this stage, that's not it at all. It just feels a little bit less spectacular when compared to Emerald Coast. I mean, the visual of our Knight of the Wind running through the skies never really gets old. Though I'd be lying if I said I didn't prefer something like the auto-demo stage. See, the stage used to be very different, as evidenced by files found in an old demo of the game, but thanks to modders, we can experience it like it was never changed. The stage feels a lot like the classic games, with top and bottom routes to take, the top being harder to maintain and you need to be careful, and the tornado section actually still exists, even though I think this is the only part of the level that actually improved upon the final version. With another Chaos Emerald in tow, Sonic and Tails head back to Station Square where Sonic gains access to a brand new power, a fake ID that allows him and Tails to access the casino. Forget the Hydro City debate, how the hell do you pronounce this? I personally say Casinoopolis, but I'm always wrong, so what team are you on? Casino Town probably has the biggest shakeup in Sonic's entire story. Instead of getting from point A to point B, it's pay to win, baby. <laughs> You need to deposit 400 rings in Scrooge the McDuck's money bin to climb up and reach the Emerald. This is sort of like how when they used to have like Xbox 360s you could win at Dave & Buster's, except the fate of the world's at stake. This being a casino, you can spend your time playing pinball to rack up that bounty if you want. There's a Sonic theme table and the vastly superior Knights table, which features music from the Saturn game and some really uncomfortable Dreamcast flavored Knights. These cinematics take way too long though. They really break up the flow of the whole thing, especially since you can get dropped into the by accident because of the random nature of pinball. Fun fact, Knights into Dreams was actually the first game I ever reviewed on this channel around four or five years ago. It's a pretty rough watch, but it was a new format for me and and I'm still happy with some of the jokes. Still gotta check out the Wii game someday. But let's be real, we don't play the pinball tables, we just wait for Sonic to fall into the trash below. This is where you're gonna find the more high speed action, or at least it would be if it wasn't mainly about being like pushed to the top of Willy Wonka's factory where the saw blades are ready to cut you up, and spike balls, just endless spike balls. I don't know what this casino's been doing, but I don't like it. 400 rings in the trash later, let's head outside with our brand new Chaos Emerald. Man, I can't can't wait to bask in the glow of triumph over our enemies. Oh sorry, no, I forgot that we suck. Once the sleepyheads wake up, they're on their way to Ice Cap Zone, but they only know that because God kinda does them another solid and drops that Mystic Ruins key right in the back alley. And while we're on that topic, when we get to the Mystic Ruins, 
the wall just explodes, and I'm sure there might be like an NPC somewhere that says, oh, we were testing our nuclear weapons over there or something, you know, to make it make sense. I know the game came out 24 years ago, but is there not anything that we could have done? Maybe give some agency back to the player at this point, because like these stones keep falling from the sky to just allow you entry to places. Walls are blowing up out of nowhere. It kind of gets on my nerves a little bit. It feels like, oh wait, yeah, I'm playing a video game. Come on, my immersion gone. Ice Cap is another stage. It certainly is a stage. It's not great. I, I think the only part that people like about this stage is the snowboarding because it harkens back to Sonic 3 and also it's just kind of neat. The first part of the stage involves you climbing all the way up this ice chamber to make a giant ice stalactite. Was that correct? <laughs> and that just paves the way for the snowboarding section. Some people just skip that entirely because they do some fancy trickery off the top of the stage so they don't even need to play it. The snowboarding isn't anything special either. It's definitely better in SA2, but SA1, you feel like you're stuck to the ground, it's made of glue or whatever, and you go off ramps to get some good speed. I don't know if you can actually die to the avalanche behind you, because I've never seen anyone collide with it, and I've never done that myself either. Kind of a god gamer. Leaving this stage will now forever remind me of the day of broken trust, as I like to call it. Right, the thing is, I don't know where to go from here. And I won't be telling you. No, I know you won't. <laughs> <laughs> Station Square, I think, though. I hope you're not lying to me. I would never do that. But I will go fight Knuckles in Mystic Ruins. I HATE YOU! <laughs> I HATE YOU! I'm very sorry, my friend. It was really funny, though. Speaking of friends, our best friend Knuckles the Echidna is outside and he wants to hang out. I really don't get what happened with these, because they have plenty of good bosses in this game, and I don't know if they were like, well, we can't design a fun boss fight based around another playable character. That would be silly. Let's just have the AI, like, walk back and forth a little bit and jump every so often. <laughs> Turns out our friend Knuckles was a little bit wary of us because Eggman showed up and told him that Sonic was doing something nefarious. Are we in Bill Murray's Groundhog Day time loop? Remember when we fought Eggman together and brought your rock back free of charge like 12 days ago? I thought we were cool. Thanks to Knuckles, Eggman now has four of the seven emeralds, and that's over half of them. Chaos is transformed into his most infamous form. I'm pretty sure everyone is sick of this guy. It's Chaos 4. This is where that repetition problem rears its head again, because not only do you have to fight this incredibly slow, basic auto-scroller of a boss fight with Sonic, you also have to do this with Tails and Knuckles. It's mind-numbingly boring. And what is this? It must be my birthday? It's back-to-back -back stinkers? We have Sky Chase with both Sonic and Tails next. In a game where it's fun to go fast, and that's kind of like the point, you know, to earn that speed, it's not my first choice to put something in your way that forces you to go at a certain pace the entire time. Like I just said with Chaos 4, it's just waiting around until the game lets you do it. The same thing with Sky Chase, thank goodness people have made mods to bypass this because playing this four times every time you play this game, no. Eggman was like super duper prepared this game, so he just shoots us out of the sky with a big laser anyway, and we get separated from Tails, so this is where you get some variety if you're playing the Tails story. Want Atari sound effect later? Sonic is bumbling around Station Square yet again when he runs into Amy Rose. She's back from Sonic CD, and she found this bird on the side of the road, and now she wants Sonic to protect it because it's in danger, and Sonic is like, protecting people in danger? Haha, <laughs> yeah, I don't do that. But he's been saving birds from robots and capsules and stuff for like the last three games, so of course he's gonna let Amy and this bird tag along. My brain sorta wants to read this scene as Sonic being really worried about finding Tails and making sure he's okay, so he's really caught off guard by Amy and all of these shenanigans. But he never, like, mentions that Tails and him just got shot out of the sky or anything. But it's not like that matters at all, because a few seconds later we meet this new robot named Zero, who, I didn't know this until this recording, is actually one of the E100 series, just like Gamma and Beta and all those guys. I feel like that should have been obvious, but 
He doesn't even have like a special bird inside him, just a regular rabbit or whatever. So it couldn't have been that important. Conveniently for Amy, there is a sign nearby that says, Hey, come to our amusement park, and if you're a cute couple, you get in for free. And Amy is like, that's us, that's me and you, let's go. And I think Sonic throws up in his mouth a little bit. Twinkle Park? Twinkle Park? Now that is a fun stage. We start out with this very iconic go-karting scene where you go down this huge track. And fun fact, if Sonic is hit with no rings in one of these cars, he is eradicated instantly. There's nothing left to bury. This is one of those times when the stage is also just as good as this little gimmick thing. Because you get to the amusement park and it's this playground of, Ooh, if I jump off of this ramp, I can take a huge shortcut. I think carnival levels are just a huge favorite of mine too. So that might be part of it, but the music's great, the visuals are awesome, and I think there are so many fun things going on in here. So many little mechanics that you have to deal with. It's great, and then also you don't find Amy because it's a huge amusement park and she got lost. And as Sonic clears the amusement park with his giant novelty Twinkle Park Big Gulp, he notices that Station Square is actually a little puny and, you know, you don't realize until this point. If we retrace our steps here, we met Amy in the casino area, came back to the main area to go to Twinkle Park, and now we're going back to the casino area to see Zero carrying Amy away through the tunnels. I guess it wouldn't make sense to have Zero in the downtown area because it's kind of a dead end, but maybe he could have jumped up and over the building and Sonic could have been like, darn, he's heading for the Mystic Ruins, I gotta catch up! That way you're not getting on a train that is following directly behind him that is absolutely faster than he is. Like literally that train should just destroy Zero in his entirety right there. Hey, but Speed Highway happens before that, and I have something written in the script about being horrified that I forgot that after playing this game so many times. And I want you to know that until I read that again just now, I was fully convinced that Speed Highway was later, and I don't know why. They say an elephant never forgets. God, I wish that were me. Speed Highway could be seen as Sonic combing the rest of the city to try and find Amy, but I think what really happened is that Sonic Team made a city level, and they didn't have any better place to put it than right here, so now I'm playing the city level. Fortunately, it's the best level in the entire game. Like, it's, it's incredible. Like, the sense of speed you get in Speed Highway is the stuff of legends, and it's a good thing it is because otherwise the name Speed Highway would be a really big false advertisement. If Emerald Coast is the perfect intro stage, Speed Highway is the best stage stage because everything you've been learning this whole game, you can, like this could be the final level, it's so good. Like I think some other, like Tails ends in Speed Highway and it's not as good because of his playstyle we'll talk about later. You're running down ramps and getting so much speed and jumping over these huge expanses with like moving platforms. And then the section where you're going down the building, it's so cool. This is like everything that Sonic was trying to be at the time. Like high speed, action packed, attitude, it's, amazingly well done. Like, this is how you put personality into something. Even once you're done running down the building and end up in that new area where the sun is just peeking over the rooftops, there's still so much to look around in and do. Like, it feels a lot more like one of those more claustrophobic classic Sonic stages. But you can go up and around the buildings, you can try and dodge cars on the bottom path we really want, and then it caps off with releasing creatures from a capsule. Amy's still not here, we already talked about what happened, I'm sorry. Once we get to the Mystic Ruins, Sonic loses Amy again because the Egg Carrier is waiting for them and just grabs her and Zero and takes off. Before Sonic's able to pursue the Egg Carrier on foot, we need to go find the Light Speed Attack power-up, and I think this is something I neglected to mention, but you probably already know about anyway. Scattered around the overworld, there are some trinkets that can make your characters do new things. The light speed dash was one of those, we got that earlier. Light speed attack is used to enter Red Mountain and one other thing, and otherwise it is completely useless. Having upgrades out in the field like this does make exploration feel kind of nice, but I'm not sure how I feel about it as a whole because Sonic is fun to play with right out of the box, but Tails and Amy get substantially better through the use of some of their power-ups. It feels kind of detrimental in some cases. I used to not like Red Mountain as a stage very much back when I was a kid, thought it was boring, but you know, as a kid I also thought I liked Sonic 06, so clearly my past self is not to be trusted. What we have here is a stage that reaches from the mist-covered peaks of mountains to the demons within. 
It's a really neat idea to have Sonic chasing the egg carrier on foot as a part of the stage. Like, I wish they had factored that in a little bit more. Like, maybe put the stage on a time limit or something. Maybe they didn't want to stress the player out. I don't know. On the outside of the mountains, you'll be jumping around on monkey bars and past lava plumes and all this mumbo jumbo. And then once you get inside, this is the part that I like the most. It's this giant cavern that keeps filling up with magma. And you need to jump onto these giant rocks to avoid getting burned. And then you see like these crazy prisoners behind these cells inside the volcano slash mountain, whatever we're in. And it's like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? They're never going to explain it, we'll never know, but maybe that's cooler because we get to come up with our own interpretations. There's definitely a difficulty spike here though, and I think that might be why my past self didn't like this stage very much. From this point on, Sonic's stages don't pull any punches. On the other side of Red Mountain, Sonic stands there helplessly as the egg carrier starts pulling way out of his reach, and I don't know what you thought was gonna happen, man, but you can't fly, so it's gonna get away. You know who does fly, though? It's Tails the Fox in the tornado bringing us yet another Sky Chase level. Could you just pretend that you weren't gonna come help me? I'd rather just let the story end here. I didn't mention this last time because I was lamenting the fact that I had to play it four times, but Sky Chase is just this very simple minigame where you hold down the button to shoot and then highlight the enemies on screen, and then a laser will go pew, and then you'll get like a combo and get points. And then you want to not get hit by things ideally, but as long as you have a little bit of health, you're going to be able to get to the boss fight just fine, where you just mash the attack button faster than you've ever done anything in your life. Midway through that sky chase section, Tails turns the tornado into the Tornado 2, and this changes not a single thing mechanically or in-universe, aside from the fact that he didn't put landing gear on this version. And with that, we are on our final hub world of the adventure, which consists of the outside and numerous interiors of the egg carrier, but uh-oh, the sky deck overstays its welcome a lot, which makes me all the happier that you can do so many skips here. Almost this entire level is a bottomless pit, by the way, so it'd be a great time for Tails to remember that he can fly Sonic around. The first section is my favorite since it's mostly normal platforming, while the second section tries to get you to be careful because of turbulence? But if you're fast enough, that problem just isn't real. The third section is just annoying. The gravity keeps changing here because of how fast the ship is flying or what direction it's going. I don't know, I'm not a bird. But thankfully, there's a big skip you can do here that skips, like, the entire section, so I just don't play this part anymore. Sonic and Tails land inside the egg carrier where they stay for about five seconds before taking an elevator back outside where they find Amy and Dr. Eggman. Eggman reveals that the bird that Amy's been hanging out with had a Chaos Emerald this whole time. He's a bird, he doesn't have pockets, what do you mean? Did someone order a character battle? Oh, we know how these go. We meet E-102 Gamma, he's out to kill us because Eggman told him to. Amy is like, please don't do that, and Sonic goes, Okay, you must have your reasons. Real talk, it's pretty nice that Sonic trusts Amy's judgment on this, and Gamma doesn't say anything again. I, the story's a little weird in this game. I feel like there were definitely some growing pains here. Thanks to some off-screen meddling, the egg carrier is now falling out of the sky, but Sonic has not had his fill of destruction yet, and he sets off to go find Dr. Eggman. Uh-oh, Chaos is looking like a snack. We gotta stop this guy. Fan-favorite demigod Big the Cat appears here, who is frantically searching for his friend Froggy, and as we will learn later, Froggy is actually storing Chaos's missing tail within his intestines. Sonic agrees to help Big get his friend back, and this is one of the only other uses of the lightspeed attack. Once Chaos is frozen, you're able to use the lightspeed attack to do double damage, making this one of the easiest boss fights in the game. And that's all she wrote. Frog secured, day saved, race you back to the ground! I know we've been separated from the gang again, and we're probably trying to find him as fast as possible to put a stop to Eggman's plans, but my GPS is telling me to take a quick pit stop in yonder temple because it'll cut 20 seconds off my route to find Eggman. Man, so obviously we gotta take advantage of that. Lost World is one of my least favorite stages. I don't like uh, most of it. I think the room with the snake and the rising water is cool conceptually, but it is a slog to play through. Plus all of the, the hitboxes on the snake are very, very weird. Like you're always sliding a little bit and it's a little nerve wracking. The part with the mirrors in the dark room, you don't even need to use the mirrors. You can just jump around and the light just kind of exists. And then that room with the moving wall tiles that you need to put in a certain order so you can run up the wall. Again, very cool idea and I like all of these different mechanics we're 
we're doing here, but it's better off doing a spin dash jump off of one of those wall tiles and trying to skip as much of it as possible. Sonic ends up in the Chamber of Foreshadowing, where he sees a mural depicting chaos in an even more monstrous state. Unsure of how to interpret this, that little ball of light we've been seeing around Station Square suddenly becomes part of the canon and transports Sonic into the Nintendo Virtual Boy, a fate worse than death. I never really figured out what Takal's doing here, if she's showing you like an interactable memory or if this is actually some Kingdom Hearts heart time travel bullshit, but either way it makes Takal out to be a very powerful ghost of Christmas past. Well anyway, what brings us to the past today? Ah, I see we've introduced a whole new wave of mental anguish. Very cool. Seems like something really bad happened with the Master Emerald, but Sonic isn't given enough information to read the situation, so we'll have to piece that together as we go. Back in reality, Sonic watches as Eggman whooshes by, and it's time we take the fight right to the doctor's doorstep. Welcome to my personal favorite area. Eggman's base is so iconic in this game, like the huge tunnel, the lights in the sky making it look like you're on the train to a huge Hollywood premiere. The celebrities! I am a huge fan of your work. Typically these kind of puzzles frustrate me because I'm too impatient to learn how they work, but I've played this one so many times that it's kind of fun. I'm a wildly inconsistent human being, I'm sorry. Final Egg is an amazing final stage. It has the same music as the Hub World area, and I'm totally fine with that because Mechanical Resonance, good golly, what a great song. It's such a sinister sounding song, but it's still really uplifting because it feels like you've gotten to the end of an adventure, like we are en route to go mess that guy up, and it feels good but maybe we're a little bit nervous? Honestly, I can listen to about any song on this soundtrack and I'm immediately transported directly into my memories of playing this game. This soundtrack is powerful. Even if this game looks super dated at this point, playing this game with headphones in in the dead of night, it's a feeling that just gives me chills. I love running through the rooms of this wacky warehouse. I can't help but wonder what else goes on here. Like, where do you think he built the E-Series robots? Like, I really want to watch him put together a motobug like it's a model kit, and then get really mad when he drops a piece of it through the graded floor into the depths of hell below him. That seems like a massive oversight, honestly. Like, what if you dropped your keys down there? What do you do? At the end of the lab, the Egg Viper battle begins. Sonic meets up with Eggman, who seems to have lost some of his polygons. That looks like extreme agony he's going through. This is another one of those run back and forth until you're able to hit him boss fights, and I mean, technically I guess it's an auto-scroller, which is something I complained about for like Chaos 4, but this is different because it actually poses a challenge. You're only able to hit the doctor when he's screaming silently into the void, and then you end up on the other side of the arena, but nothing really changes until later, because they'll start breaking platforms, you have less room to run around. He even starts throwing his little saw blades at you, which actually makes it easier to hit him faster. So you gotta hand it to good old Doc Robotnik, he's always thinking of how to make his boss fights more fun. He is a bit of a sore loser though, since Sonic makes quick work of this thing. He tries to take out the platform you're standing on, but we're too handsome for that to work. Hey, I'll play with you some other time. Uh, no Sonic, I don't think you will. And that's how Sonic's story ends. We kill the guy. I always really loved the part of the ending where Sonic meets back up with Tails and they talk about what happened since the egg carrier, though I think the scene feels a little cooler if you've just finished Tails' story. Since the besties are hanging out for almost the entire game, for this and the rest of the stories I'll be glossing over repeat cutscenes unless something substantial happens. Tails' story of course begins on Tuesday when he crashes his plane, he then takes Sonic to the Mystic Ruins and they face off against the Egg Hornet. The encounter here is completely tonally different though because Tails sees Eggman as this crazy intimidating force that's like dripping with malice. I think this is really effective though, especially with the portrayal from Dean Bristow. He absolutely nails this really sinister vibe. Tails' entire gimmick for this campaign is that he is playing through the same levels we've already played as Sonic, except this time we are racing Sonic to the end. And since Tails can fly, there is no contest here whatsoever. If you ever lose one of these, I think you must have put the controller down. It is stupid easy to abuse Tail's flight in this game, especially if you grab the jet anklet power-up before you head over here. You can just fly very far and very fast, and not to mention there are booster rings all over the place, just in case you thought it wasn't easy enough. These things fly by, pun entirely intended, and you will be at the Chaos Emerald in each stage before Sonic can even make it halfway. Like, the dude can't even rubber band fast enough to catch up to you. Things don't divert much until we get to the Sky Chase fiasco, where something something Tuesday again 
Tails is on the ground and he starts having like a fever dream about when he first met Sonic. We all know the story, he was alone, people were making fun of him because he had two tails and could fly. And I'm just gonna say it again, I think everyone else was jealous because this kid is a super genius and also he can fly. He could literally be their king. Tails doesn't see it that way though until he meets Sonic, who gives him the confidence to come out of his shell and be himself. It's really a beautiful friendship. Mmm, wow, that dream brought back memories. Uh, yeah, that's what dreams are, Tails. Maybe I was wrong about the smart thing. Uh, whatever, let's go play Minecraft in the woods. While we're out here just mining our own business, Tails stumbles upon a diamond, but it's only a one vein, so that kind of sucks. Or at least we would have that diamond if it wasn't for a perfectly timed frog moment. Man, I hope he doesn't choke on that thing, it's kind of huge. Tails gets his own unique mini stage here in the form of Sand Hill. It reuses the ice cap snowboarding gimmick. Down at the bottom, we are living large, frog in hand, but that's when that pesky bee shows up again and we're transported to the past. The game sort of contradicts itself when it comes to this. I still don't know if it's time travel because sometimes Sonic will just come back and be like, I was on a snooze cruise, I guess. But here, Tails is actually placed in a completely different location upon waking up from this dream. Plus, we're able to explore the entire ancient Echidna civilization this time, even parts where Takal is not standing, complete with like a thousand clones you can talk to. They were even nice enough to get Tails this little Christmas present that you can permanently miss on the file if you're not careful. I kinda wanted a Game Boy, but I guess it's the thought that counts, right? Takal is waiting nearby to tell Tails this cool nursery rhyme she knows before Tails appears back in the present just in time to be mauled by a rabid cat. We still have the emerald we were looking for, though, so the frog situation is inconsequential. Wait, how did Tails get that out of Froggy? My god, he was piloting my man like Kermit the Frog. From here, Tails goes to work on the tornado for the inevitable rematch with the Egg Carrier. He finds Sonic, they do Sky Chase, they do Sky Deck, and then, after beating up E-102 Gamma again, Sonic vows to kill Dr. Eggman. Or at least that's what it sounds like, and Tails, Amy, and Gamma head out so they're not implicated in the murder. Eggman does not survive the crash. Seeing as his plans are completely scrambled and chaos is defeated, Eggman launches a missile at Station Square, and because the universe hates him more than everyone else, it doesn't go off. This opens up the perfect final level for Tails, where he races Eggman through Speed Highway of all places to get to that missile before he can. The scene right before the final boss here always gave me goosebumps. Tails with his wavering voice, which could have just been the weird performance, but you know, I'm willing to look past it. He knows he can save everyone despite Eggman's chilling threats, and he stands up, and he does it. The Egg Walker fight's not even close to being as cool as Egg Viper, it's mainly just a waiting game, avoiding attacks, and then you gotta hit the giant glowing spot on the legs until Eggman decides he's ready to go get his ass kicked by Sonic over in Final Egg. This man really just bounces between failures, it must be really demoralizing. Despite the lackluster final boss, it's all worth it to see Tails be this proud of himself. Like, a lot of people ask me why I was so mad at the Tails from, like, colors onwards. And this is why, like, he fights his little heart out and he knows he can protect the world and the people he cares about, but the newer games just sideline him in favor of having Sonic do everything. And that is why I'm so happy in Frontiers they're actually taking the steps to improve the character again. Now we're on to Knuckles the Echidna, the last remaining Echidna in the world, and how does that work again? We're going back in time to like 500 BC before Chaos to talk to Takal, but Knuckles lives in the present. So how old is he, or how does this timeline work? Like, you see what I mean, right? Because when Knuckles goes back in time, he's like, What is this place? Who are you people? I don't know you people. So clearly this didn't happen recently. Did the Echidnas go extinct? a second time within the last several years? We'll probably never know the answer to that, but we've got more pressing issues as Chaos jump scares Knuckles, destroying the Master Emerald in the process. This, of course, causes Angel Island to drop into the ocean and Knuckles to be a little miffed that he's been so bad at his job lately. Nothing a quick trip to the city can't fix, gonna hit up the Blockbuster because it's 1998 and it still exists. And people thought Y2K was gonna be the scariest thing of the 2000s. We lost a real one. Knuckles takes the second part of Speed Highway as his first stage. Treasure hunting is something that I'd go 
on to despise once we hit the sequel, but here it feels fast enough because of how the Emerald radar works. Since it can track all three Emerald shards at the same time, gliding around the much smaller levels of SA1 means you always get a clear picture of where to go, and if you don't, Takal hangs around and will fly in the general direction of where you should be looking, and I think it's kind of fitting to have Takal here throughout Knuckles' story, since he's the one who should probably be most concerned about an ancient deceased echidna haunting the present day. Well, that's a little ominous. Our boy heads to the casino next, but Pinball is the farthest thing from his mind. No need to bank rings either, though that would have been a neat idea for this stage. Imagine hunting down the emerald shards and also a bunch of ring boxes so you could reach the final shard or something. I guess it'd be a huge pain if you get hit, but it would have taken the stage's gimmick more into account. Oh look, and there's Tikal, here to save us from the evil that is gambling. Back in the past, we're allowed to roam the temple again, and the ancient echidnas really seem like those dude bros at the gym that only ever talk about lifting, except they're talking about the upcoming cataclysm they plan on causing by abusing the power of the emeralds. The real reason Knuckles is here is to show the strained relationship Tikal has with her father, Pakamak, the leader of the tribe. As she puts it, stealing and killing are not a good path to peace, which from a logical standpoint holds a lot of water. But I love stealing and killing. Back in the present, Knuckles promptly ignores this vision of his ancestors. I swear, for a story-focused game, they do a really good job of leaving holes like this. Like, with everything going on with the Master Emerald, the thing that he has dedicated his entire life to protect, he sees a vision of his ancient ancestors and he just goes, Man, that's weird. Better lay off the grapes. Thanks to Takal's masterful planning and puppeteering of this entire situation, Knuckles arrives back in the present to see Eggman entering the second elevator, that mythical place that no one else but Knuckles and him can tread. Within that fabled land, Knuckles finds Eggman with something he thinks is a Master Emerald Shard, but actually turns out to be a Chaos Emerald, and Knuckles goes, Oh yeah, well I guess that's fine, that's probably not gonna lead to any problems. Dude, I don't care if Eggman's carrying around just that egg-shaped rock from outside Speed Highway. We need to end this right now before it gets any worse. Chaos 2 was born here, and I think this might be one of my favorite looks for him. He's super beefy and menacing with those giant robot arms, and it looks like he'd pack a huge punch, but his only move is turning into an exercise ball and jumping around the room, so I'm not sure why he was designed like that. Suffice to say, the Echidna takes the equ wind no, and then promptly falls for Eggman's trickery again, even though Eggman has lied to him before and literally just tried to kill him in this very room. I can sort of see where the idiot Knuckles trope came from. We're just not gonna worry about that for now, though, because we have a monkey to deal with over at Red Mountain. But to defeat this primate, we need the monkey destruction switch, a horrifying discovery that should have remained buried. Better watch out, Donkey Kong. Red Mountain is my favorite treasure stage by far. I think climbing around these areas that used to loom overhead in Sonic Story really carves out the differences between Sonic and Knuckles. Knuckles is a quick, strong, and resourceful fella, able to do things Sonic can't, but they both make it through just fine, and I think that's wonderful. I get a priceless rock and a miniature gorilla best friend? It must be my birthday. Speaking of, Sonic, you are not invited to my birthday party, man. And you. You're only here because my mom told me I had to invite you to the party. After making up with Sonic, Knuckles heads out to dick around in the forest for 45 minutes looking for magical stone keys that we'll never speak of again. You know, Lost World's actually not that bad of a stage when you're able to climb all over the whole thing like an ant on a picnic basket. I even kind of appreciate this stage a little more as Knuckles. I feel like I'm on top of the world. What the heck are those things? Could someone please explain this to me? Those are Smurfs. I'm surprised you've never heard of them. Okay, thank you, Doug Walker. All the proceeds for these cameos he did went to charity, by the way, so that's pretty cool. Tikal seems to be conferring with the Master Emerald, trying to assure it that her father doesn't know what he's messing with, and... Oh boy, I'm sensing some danger ahead for the Echidna tribe. Tikal drops off Knuckles at home, where he rebuilds the Master Emerald and is able to confirm that his Hulu subscription is still active. Now it's off to the Egg Carrier for his Knuckles final stage. Why did I read it like that? That's not what I wrote. Getting to the Egg Carrier is actually a little weird, because you just go to Eggman's base in the Mystic Ruins, and then Knuckles appears on the Egg Carrier, so I assume that means he got onto it before it launched? I was digging through my memory to try and figure out how he got up there, but I couldn't remember. Like, he just follows Gamma, and then he's on the Egg Carrier. Knuckles' final stage is Sky Deck, but it's that big open area from the end of Sonic's level. This time we have control of the ship's tilt, which probably means the ship was losing altitude earlier because Knuckles was taking it for a joyride. This one I find really annoying because you move the joystick and then the ship is on a different tilt, so you can't really jump around certain ways, like certain things will move so you can reveal emeralds below them or reach different areas. It's just tedious, like I wish they had more switches 
around the thing so you didn't have to keep running back to the beginning of the stage to keep changing the tilt. But as a final level, I guess it's just irritating enough to slip by. Knuckles Finale is really underwhelming in my eyes because I think his entire story was a bit of a waste. Like, of course he's going after the Master Emerald Shards, but you think since Chaos is directly linked with the Emerald, that would be very important to him. All of these things he's seeing of Tikal's memories would be incredibly important because he's always going on about how he's the last Echidna and it's really upsetting. Why not delve more into that? Knuckles is also the only other character aside from Big who doesn't have a unique final encounter, they just fight someone else's boss. And then he just kind of goes back to Angel Island and he's back at status quo. I guess it's just a story about how this is just another Tuesday for him or something. Yeah, it's kind of weak. I know the game's 24 years old, but that doesn't make all this missed potential such suddenly fine in my book, because you know what else came out in 1998? Metal Gear Solid, Ocarina of Time, Half-Life, they tell their stories pretty well. And while I'm ranting about story, let's talk about Amy's. The missed potential train is about to leave the station yet again. For Amy's first playable role, they came up with some good ideas for the moveset. Running and using her hammer flip jump, there is nothing I can think of that compares to how cool that feels. But her central gimmick revolves around running from this new robot, Zero, so every level you're constantly being hunted down. And while that sounds fun, Zero is easier to dodge than a street sign, and those don't typically move. And you can just hit him a couple times each level to get him off your tail. Like, the cutscenes make him feel like such a legitimate threat, but spoilers, Amy kicks the shit out of him in every single level and the final battle, so this is a huge immersion breaker. This just leaves Amy's levels as a slower-paced romp through what we've already played through as Sonic, with a different moveset that doesn't really change much. There are some small things, like exploring new sections of Twinkle Park, which explains how how Sonic couldn't find Amy, or Final Egg, where Zero does this cute little jump scare, but only three levels are hardly anything to speak for. Amy's story is really underwhelming in both gameplay and plot. That's not to say I dislike her story as a whole, I just think there's a lot of missed opportunities here. For instance, I do like the intro where she's walking with her bag of groceries back to her one-room apartment, when all of a sudden, BAM, the egg carrier is overhead, and it's that iconic scene from the CGI intro trailer. And like she just walked into a Disney Channel original movie, she's the bird babysitter. It's cool that she wants to help this bird, though, shows that she's really a friend to everybody. And speaking of friends, her friend Sonic could probably help her out. And by complete coincidence, we're we're in luck, Sonic the Hedgehog just so happens to have dropped into town today. Then we do Twinkle Park, and then right outside Twinkle Park, in the exact place we just were, Amy gets captured. Like, Zero could have just waited out there for us to leave Twinkle Park and had the exact same result. Could have just been sitting there, reading the newspaper, sipping a pot of coffee. Sorry, that's a silly thought. He'd be drinking oil. We cut to the comically oversized prison that Eggman stores on his egg carrier. Gamma even looks a little bit small next to some of this stuff. This is my favorite part of the story because we get this really interesting scene where Gamma, on order from Eggman, comes into the prison to try and take the bird from Amy. And Amy's like, why are you listening to that guy? He's kind of the worst. This is enough to get him to free Amy, letting the two escape. And this is a pretty cool moment for Gamma and Amy, because it seems like there's this interesting friendship thing happening, and maybe Gamma is going to be a new ally. And then 40 seconds later, this is the last time we will ever see these characters interact. So whatever that weird friendship angle was, it just completely thrown out the window immediately which I think is a huge missed opportunity. It would have been so cool if when they all landed together, maybe Gamma would be like, how do I help my friends? And Amy could have been like, I'm great at helping my friends. I'm doing it right now because they're friends. But instead we get back down to the ground and then Amy is like, if Eggman was looking for this bird, maybe he already had the other two birds. Let's go back to the egg carrier now that it's crashed and we go look for those other birds in final egg, but unfortunately they've already hatched and left. I really like this part though, because this is showing that Sonic's influence on Amy has not just been one of like her being totally in love with him. This is her showing characteristics that she's gained from her admiration of Sonic. And clearly I'm overanalyzing all this stuff, it's just a funny hedgehog game, but like, if they'd taken Amy this route instead of just keeping her in that, like, limbo of being annoying, I think she could have turned into a really solid character after this. That's beside the point, I guess, but we don't find the bird in Final Egg, so we head back out onto the remains of the egg carrier and...
This dude shows up at the club with no further orders to slap this bird out of the air. What an absolute ass. I know Zero hasn't really been a threat throughout this campaign, but this just makes it even more cathartic to start slapping this guy against electric fences until he explodes. I love this fight, not because it's super engaging and fun and cool, it's really easy because Zero's a pushover. It just feels really nice to get payback in there at the end of it. It's like, that was a good move, Sonic Team. You weaponized the anger. And seeing this blinding fury, Birdie returns to life completely unharmed from the incident, and they actually found their family too. So I'd call this a win. I'm sure nothing emotionally devastating happened to allow that other bird to be here. That's the end of Amy's campaign. Again, a lot of missed opportunities here and missed opportunities going forwards because you can see the seeds of a character being planted here, but come SA2, she gets to Promoted to multiplayer only and doesn't really do much in the story either. I'm telling you, dude, I think this would have been a really good way to get a character moving, but instead we just have that point in the canon where she suddenly changes personality, like, inexplicably. New character of the series, E-102 Gamma, is the second most surprising addition to this game. A character with a gun in a Sonic the Hedgehog game? That's unheard of! Probably should have kept it that way. But for a new robot guy in the series, he can't really help it, the gun was built into his arm, and with that gun, he shall do the right thing. Like in Sky Chase, Gamma is able to hold down the attack button and lock onto enemies. Letting go of the fire button will blast everything you've highlighted, giving you more time on your timer. Run out of time and Gamma powers down like Eggman forgot to plug him in last night. We've all been there. Couple that with none of his stages being auto-scrollers, and Gamma is actually one of my favorite campaigns in this game. I mean, he's leagues better than Tails and Amy. Might be a little bit better than Knuckles too, because his gameplay fits perfectly in with the story he's experiencing. It's a bright and wonderful day in the Mystic Ruins when Eggman first brings E-102 Gamma online. He observes the world around him, seeing his creator for the first time, and the first experience he has with any other sentient creature is being ordered around. Fresh off the presses of Eggman's presses, we have E-102 Gamma, who is one of the E-Series robots. Gamma and his siblings are basically the iPhones of robots, whereas Eggman's old creations, the Badniks, might as well be classified as that shitty little flip phone you had in middle school. Or at least that I had in middle school. His first objective upon being brought into the world is to destroy the Sonic doll at the end of Final Egg. A uh, final egg? More like first egg, because it's the first level instead of the last one this time. You might have thought that was super easy, but that's because it was actually just a bait and switch. Our real first task is to fight our brother Beta to the death to see who gets to get onto the egg carrier. And I'm just saying, with a name like Beta, I'm pretty sure our Chad is gonna come out on top. For those who pay attention though, Beta's loss here is actually the first hint that something else is going on here, since Beta basically begs for his life. And Eggman reluctantly decides to bring Beta along as spare parts, which might be an insult, but might also be foreshadowing. Gamma doesn't seem to react to this. Aboard the Egg Carrier, Eggman puts on this big flashy light show just to talk to his own robots, and honestly, you gotta love the narcissistic tendencies there. Like, he's at least consistent. The guy is a showman at heart. Give him his amusement park. For our real, true first mission, we need to go make out. Make out? That's not what we're doing, that was a slip of the tongue. What we're actually doing is going to find a frog that made off with Chaos's tail, and that's why I said that. I know at this point we're supposed to be like, oh no, Chaos is missing his tail, we need to go get that back for him, but imagine the havoc that that poor frog's guts have been being put through. Dude grew an entire tail because of an ancient parasite infesting his colon. Fun fact, since I assume most people have never seen this, if Gamma talks to the hotel manager, he asks if he's seen Froggy, and the manager thinks he's looking for a hotel guest. I don't really talk to NPCs that much in this game, but I'm glad I saw that at least. Gamma's hunting ground is Emerald Coast, now full of expensive hotel property that we can melt for the time bonus. This is another really short stage, I think technically more dangerous than Final Egg. I think most of Gamma's levels are kind of short because of the time restriction thing, so it's more about how fast can you get to the end and how much time bonus will you have left over. Oh, there's my Amazon package, thanks man. Before our best bot can return to 
Central Command, Takal strangely intercepts him and sends him to the past for some plot. This is a big point of confusion for me because I'm not sure why Takal would choose Gamma for this, especially at this point in his story. He hasn't really done anything good yet, but she's a spooky spirit, so maybe she can just catch his good vibes. This is a really cute scene though. Takal is initially scared of Gamma, but once he calmly just watches the Cha with her, they share a nice moment. Chaos is treated really different too. Takal says he's a nice guy, and apparently Gamma can pick up on that. And if you'll allow me to spoil things right here, it is a massive shame that Gamma never interacts with Chaos even once. The way his story goes, like having him learn this information super early on could have had Gamma try to talk to Chaos, relate to him, seeing as they're both trapped, one in a metal suit and another in a huge emerald. They could have had Gamma intervene in a fight that another character was having with Chaos, sort of like Amy did for him. This living weapons angle, being treated like they're just something used to cause destruction when they don't need to be, it would have actually been a little bit like Archie Gamma because Shadow is like, hey, I'm a living weapon technically because I was created for, you know, mischievous purposes. Gamma, you're out there in the wilderness and you're a rogue Eggman robot, also a living weapon. We should just be friends and you should just come with me back to Gun. In this story, Gamma is actually an evolution of his adventure self because he doesn't die once he defeats all the E-Series robots. He just goes around fighting the Eggman forces behind the scenes completely on his own. And unfortunately, his story still ends in destruction at the hands of Omega this time, who apparently merges with Gamma's soul, so he becomes a good guy after that point. But then of course later on in Archie they have those Genesis waves, so everything that happened in the past really didn't happen. I like this idea a lot for Gamma, like I love him in this game, but I feel like they could have done so much more with the character. And for the future, it's not to say that I'm not happy that they brought Omega into the fold at that point. I love Omega, I think he's my second favorite character in the entire canon, but Gamma is a very close third. With that, it's time to finally turn in our project. Eggman is pissed off at the other E-Series dummies, but Gamma gets the gratitude. He acts a bit like a dog when you raise the pitch of your voice a little bit, you know how they get all excited. This is unfortunately bad news bears for the rest of the bots though, because he watches as his siblings are whisked away to parts unknown, simply because they failed one mission. What kind of treatment is that? Delta has just enough time to look to Gamma in their last moments, and this time, Gamma notices that there might be more to them than just circuits and parts. There's no time to mourn, however, as Dr. Eggman requests that Gamma bring him the bird being kept in the jail cell out back. Thanks to the wacky spinning carnival floor Eggman installed, Gamma ends up in the wrong room. This is the wrong room. I know, I just said that. If Gamma is the iPhone of robots, ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to introduce the iPhone 2. This is like walking in on someone mid-chest surgery. Gamma is absolutely horrified, or at least as horrified as a robot can show. Gamma's finding a lot of reasons to dislike his creator in the last five minutes. Over in prison, we know what happens. Amy and the bird talk some sense into Gamma, and now we know he has already been doubting his boss before he walked in here. It's not just a random pivot to the side of good. Immediately afterwards, Gamma is called to the bridge for a character battle with Sonic, and just when it looks like Gamma has the upper hand, Amy jumps in, reminding him that he doesn't have to do what Eggman says, because he's better than that. And Gamma drops Eggman for good as he slowly drops into the Mystic Ruins. His new mission? Save his siblings from the eternal punishment that is being a small animal housed within a robot. Eggman really just dropped all these robots into nature, like you'd flush a gator down the toilet in the middle of Florida when it gets too big or whatever. This must be horrible for the ecosystem. The plot is fairly non-existent for a while, you just sweep through Windy Valley, Red Mountain, and then head back to the crashed egg carrier for Hot Shelter, where Gamma comes to a somber conclusion. The only E-Series robots remaining are Beta and himself. And of course, E-100-0, but who gives a shit about that guy? Gamma doesn't have time to come to terms with this though, as Beta flies overhead to the site of their final battle. In the arena where Sonic and Knuckles fought Chaos 6, brothers clash in the best boss fight outside of Sonic's story. Beta's former fear has seemingly either been completely overwritten or is just really mad at Gamma for beating him before. It's unfortunate we never get dialogue between these two, but they're still machines of war at the end of the day. And it's clearly not an easy encounter for either of them. But history repeats itself and Gamma takes the win. With Beta going belly up, Gamma thinks it's safe to approach, but this was Beta's plan. His last action being a fake out to blast Gamma in the chest point blank. Beta succumbs to his injuries and explodes. 
Gamma thinks back on his short life and knows this is how things were meant to be. Falling over and dying beside his brother, releasing the red bird from within. To make things more sappy for a second, if you listen to Gamma's theme, the only lyrics in the entire thing are Get that emerald, it's my pleasure, and ready to die. There's no other way this could have ended, and it's a devastatingly bittersweet note to end on. So we won't end on that, we'll uh, end on Big the Cat's story. This is the only part of this entire four game retrospective I've been planning that I have no notes on because he just shouldn't have been here. I can get over the gun mode they added to this game because they gave me one of the most wonderful and precious characters this series has to offer. But Big the Cat should have been a side mode, just a fishing minigame, a random challenge, maybe a mission mode edition, I don't care. The fact that there is any story in this scenario at all reminds me of the fact that Kingdom Hearts had a game on flip phones that was canon to the series. They even remade Coded for the 3DS and also put all of the cutscenes on one of those PS4 collections, because it was that important, I guess? Nothing happens in that game. It's just Mickey, Donald, and Goofy on DeviantArt for like four hours. They put bugs in him! What?! The only saving grace of Big's campaign is that it's really short, just like Amy's, and when you know where Froggy is, it takes less time to catch him, assuming the Froggy object actually does what it's supposed to and tries to bite your lure. I can't believe Big actually goes back in time too. Like, these scenes are made specifically for the player to view them, because the characters never talk about any of this shit other than in the last story. The only real tie to the overall story here is that Froggy swallows a piece of chaos, or it looks more like Chaos jumps down his throat, but whatever. That's it. Big chases Froggy, Big gets Froggy back, Big loses Froggy, and then you do this really funny Chaos 6 boss fight at the very end of Big's story where it takes literally four seconds. Can we just talk about last story now? I got a little too wound up there, I think I need a drink. Oh yeah, thanks, the life-giving liquid. Now I'll never go thirsty. And we begin by checking back in with Eggman, who is not having a great day. All is fun new, robots are toast, Chaos is gone for good. Okay, well his robots are still broken. Knuckles is over on Angel Island when he notices Eggman just show up and he's out of his Eggmobile, which hardly ever happens these days. Using the momentary confusion, Chaos jumps Knuckles and everything goes black. Sonic and Tails head to the Master Emerald Shrine where the six emeralds they had before are gone and Knuckles and Eggman are having a sleepover and they didn't invite us. Sonic is pulled to the past one last time to see the Echidna tribe ignoring Takal's final warnings and they eat shit. Takal wakes up to find her whole tribe dead and gone and she seals Chaos and herself within the Master Emerald. And since I still quote this to this very day, when Sonic comes out of the past again and talks to Tails, he goes, <laughs> I was on a snooze cruise, I guess. Snooze cruise, I love it. That is one of my favorite sayings. We need to find the final Chaos Emerald before Chaos does, but since his name is literally written on the Emerald, we don't make it in time. With Chaos in his perfect form, there's nothing anyone can do to stop him. He lays waste to Station Square, he shoots Eggman's spare egg carrier out of the sky, and even Takal herself shows up because the situation is so dire. Takal thinks the best course of action is to lock Chaos up back in the Master Emerald, but actually using some of the information from the flashbacks he's always ignoring, he wonders if that'll help anything at this point due to how angry and unstable he's become. Having gone so mad with power, Chaos even ejects the emeralds, now all grey and useless, because he's sapped all of the power from them. But as the remaining pieces of the puzzle drop into place, literally because they spawn in the air for some reason, Tails thinks that Sonic might have a shot if he uses the positive power of the Chaos Emeralds to combat the negative energy that Chaos absorbed. And you all know what happens next. Go Sonic! Yeah! It's cheesy, it looks dated, it's an easy fight, I don't care. Putting myself in Kid Me's shoes again, the first time I ever got here, I was pumped to discover Last Story even existed. I'd formed bonds with all these characters by this point, even Big the Cat, who I still wasn't a huge fan of, and seeing Eggman down and out following Chaos's attack had me at the edge of my seat. The second Open Your Heart kicks in, 
That was the nail that sealed the coffin. It was so suspenseful at this point. Everything is teetering on the brink of total annihilation. Sonic is their last hope. And it feels like it every time I get to this point. I feel that same way. The grand nature of this finale, despite how much the game has aged, will never cease to get my heart racing. And I know that was a lot of praise for two phases of flying down the ruined streets, hovering above the tsunami to slam face first into chaos at top speed. It's really not complicated or difficult at all. You might get hit by a stray attack here and there and have to chase chaos down the street again, but this raises the stakes a lot since you're on borrowed time with that draining ring count. With enough bops to the brain, chaos drops down to his base form, unsure of what's going on. That's when Takal reveals the Chao that Chaos protected all those years ago were still around, and as they flock to their protector, you can almost feel Chaos's heart start beating again. Together with Takal, finally free of his hatred for those long-concluded events, the two pass on to the afterlife, bringing Sonic Adventure to a close. And not to be cliche, but what an adventure it was. The Sonic adventure of a lifetime, you could say. I owe a lot to this game. It's my first Sonic game, and I couldn't have asked for a better experience or better franchise to fall in love with. I know it has its problems, a lot of problems, and I'm not fond of a lot of things found in this game, but that's never stopped me from coming back and taking on the entire game time and time again. And it won't stop me in the future either, since the replayability of this game is insane. And with every revisit, I challenge my knowledge of it more and more. Taking more risks, finding new secrets, raising new chow for the agonizingly painful racing minigame. So what if SA2 is better in almost every single way? It's Sonic's transition to 3D. And it was magical. This is a really long video, and most people are not going to get to this point, but thank you so much for watching all this way. If you made it this far, please let me know down in the comments, because now you're in the secret club. And if you like this video and you haven't already, please make sure you subscribe, click the bell, follow my Twitter, and join the Discord to keep up with more Sonic and other things that aren't Sonic, because I do a lot of things. If you like my content, you can definitely check out my Garilla64 gaming channel, where I upload a video every day of the week, and also my streaming channel, where I stream at least twice a week. I'd also like to give a huge thank you to my current supporters of the channel who are Marrow Wacky SMG01, Brady Hilkemeyer, Mimic, Noah Wizbios, Minty, Mega Traffic Cone, Dax, Scratch Tech 64, Danny Lee Dauber, Ty Little Tech Guy, Jeremy, Crystal, Chaos, Dork in a Hat, and on Patreon we have Noah Wizbios again and Gino the Puppet. Also, a huge thank you to everyone who's supporting in the $1 tier, really helps a lot, and if you have any interest in becoming a supporter yourself, you can check out either my Patreon or the join button below the video. It's because of you guys that I can do this and not much else, and I really appreciate it. But for now, I'm gonna leave you be, so I hope you have a good one, and I'll see you next time.